Thanks, David. Um, as David said, it's nice to be uh, back here, but actually, as a, I suppose we can nearly call ourselves an operator, uh, instead of as an analyst, as I was uh, before. Um, you may be scratching your head and trying to think what is uh, Alliance Bernstein, which is an asset management company, uh, doing in the oil and gas business, but we do have uh, a unit within Alliance Bernstein, which um, I'm in, uh, where we take direct investments in oil and gas uh, operations and unconventional uh, exploration opportunities, of which we have a number uh, on our books. Uh, we're a partner uh, in one and an operator in a number of others. Um, uh, we are in the shale oil business um, in the US uh, with uh, direct positions where we operate. Um, and this talk I thought would be largely to give you a flavor of some of our research and understanding of shale oil, um, because it's an area that I feel is very uh, misunderstood. Um, and frankly, hardly any research has been done at all uh, in what uh, I suppose people are looking forward to, to being the next big boom um, in oil production for the next 20 years. Um, so let's get specific. We are going to be talking about shale oil. We're not talking about oil, shale. Um, so we're not talking about something that needs to be mined and then cooked or retorted to get the oil out of this. This is uh, oil which is currently in the shale or in adjacent rocks to the source rock that you can extract using uh, the modern uh, drilling techniques that you use for uh, shale gas uh, to get it out of the ground. So the, the classic example here um, is the Bakken um, in uh, North Dakota and Montana, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. We're not going to talk about natural gas liquids. Um, we're very specific on this, uh, that we are after crude oil. We are quite skeptical about the natural gas liquid market in the US unless the US wants to continue barbecuing for every meal of every day throughout the year. We think that there could be a massively oversupplied market for natural gas liquids um, in the US. So we're interested in crude oil. Um, and what I'd like to walk through is to give you a flavor of why we're interested in this and why we do think that this is something that has legs and it's not all hype. Right, so hopefully you can see some of this. Um, let's just go through some of the basic mechanics um, of, uh, of unconventional oil and gas. Um, I've stolen a few slides from uh, my colleague Marlon Downey, who is part of our technical team. He runs a company called Roxana Associates that work exclusively uh, for us. Um, and this is for one, from one of his presentations, really just to go through the challenges and some of the reasons why unconventional works and why it exists in the first place. So the, the big gray dot is a typical uh, pour throat from a, a standard uh, reservoir, conventional reservoir, uh, say in the Gulf of Mexico or in the North Sea. And the little dot you see down at the bottom, let's see if this technology works, there we go. That is uh, the pour throat from a tight sandstone, but read into this uh, a, a shale or a siltstone as well. Um, the, the whole mechanics behind unconventional gas and oil, like if you really boil it right down to the, the basics are, you need a very organic rich source rock that under the right pressure, temperature uh, and various other conditions will convert itself into oil or gas expand in volume so that you start to squeeze the oil or gas into even the smallest pore spaces. So when you look at a conventional reservoir, you're effectively trying to squeeze the gas molecule using buoyancy from uh, an aquifer system into pore spaces which are reasonably large. Um, when you get down to tight gas and shale gas and tight oil, you need enormous amounts of pressure to get these molecules into the pore throats um, of your particular formation. And that's why you need incredible quality source rocks. So not all source rocks will do, and you need an incredible set of conditions uh, to be in place. Now, what does this mean uh, if we move forward for, oops, uh, for shale oil? Well, what is shale oil and how does it actually form? So this is a, a slide looking at, uh, let's call it a, a shale. 
and looking at where the little bits of kerogen start to form um, um, and how it actually starts to convert um, into bitumen and then into um, oil. What's interesting is that the kerogen collects along the solid organic layers and it, it uh, collects along cracks uh, within uh, the shale. The issue when you're trying to extract shale oil is, first of all, can you get this into a tight, per quality conventional reservoir that's lying adjacent to this uh, or organic um, uh, source rock, such as a, a, a tight dolomite or a limestone or something like that? And secondly, can you find a way to fracture this rock to extract the oil um, into a conventional uh, borehole? And I think there's a number of very interesting things that not many people know about unconventional oil, or, or I should say uh, shale oil. Um, the first is um, it produces very light, sweet oil. And the basic reason behind this is that the microbes that will eventually turn the oil and, and uh, biodegrade it into uh, lower API and more sulfurous um, oil don't exist because there's a lack of water in these systems and also you've got very small spaces for the microbes to exist. So typically the oils you get out are very high, like high 30s API with very, very low sulfur content. If you're finding that you've got an oil show from a shale with a high sulfur content, then I would argue it's not actually a shale oil. It has had some water present somewhere in the system, which means pretty much that you're not going to be commercially, uh, you're not going to be able to extract um, uh, the shale oil commercially. Um, so you need to know what you're dealing with. You need to be uh, very clued in on the very specific characteristics um, of the organic matter and, and how it's going to convert um, into oil. Um, to what things you're looking for, uh, the, the, the key one is high TOC um, in the rock. Um, if this isn't a very good quality source rock, the chances of you having uh, generating huge amounts of oil and gas that will squeeze into very tight spores, pore spaces um, is very low. You need to have a high S1 number, and I'll explain uh, what that is uh, later if you're all forgetting uh, your early geochemistry uh, courses. But uh, S1 is basically a measurement of the free volatile um, hydrocarbons in, in, in the rock. Uh, the source rock typically needs to be thick, but it needs to be thick and have a high TOC. It, it can benefit by being close to uh, different types of carbonate, such as uh, type dolomite that will fracture um, easily. Obviously, it has to be currently within um, the oil window or got, went into the oil window but got uplifted out of the oil window. Uh, you're concentrating very much on uh, kerogen types 1 and 2. Uh, Primarily to uh, the waxy crude that you typically get from a, a type 1 um, is, is not that great. Um, you're looking for a high um, hydrocarbon index over 650, normal to high pressure. You don't actually need high pressure all the time. That's a big, uh, uh, a, a big one that I know a lot of big oil companies look for. It always has to be high pressure, has to be high pressure. It doesn't have to be. Remember, these rocks are not the best. Uh, in, in terms of telling you what's in them or releasing the volumes out. So actually you can drill a, a vertical well and find out that the shale is normally pressured. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's normally pressured in the horizontal sense as well, that may be a bit problematic uh, or under pressured, but um, uh, w we don't have to see high pressure. You need reasonable porosity, like two to 3% in a conventional reservoir is obviously rubbish, but um, here um, it can work. Um, you need relatively layer cake um, uh, stratigraphy. Um, you need uh, normal fractures help. Um, and the shale itself, you're targeting areas to frack that have got a relatively high quartz uh, content. But overall, again, you just need really high oil saturation. So you don't want to see a rock that's gone halfway back through uh, into uh, the gas window again and you've had high conversion out of oil back into, uh, into gas. Just to give you, I really am only pressing this once. There we go. Uh, just to give you an idea of 
that a lot of science and a lot of research has to go into this. You can't just walk out and just grab acreage based on the fact that you think there's a source rock in existence. What we have found is that it all depends what type of source rock and it all depends what type of type of source rock you actually have. This is because when you're trying to determine what is the Tmax the, the particular source rock went into, like where it is, where the reactivation energy has got it to create um, oil, you need to know, for example, in a type 2 marine source rock, is it a fast reactivation energy, medium, fast, medium, or slow? Because that will very much determine what, what uh, your uh, Tmax is for converting uh, into oil. It will also tell you how big your potential area or sweet spot, the core area of your play actually is. Wandering in with just a broad brush, 435 Tmax cutoff for oil generation is absolutely wrong. And you're going to buy a lot of acreage that potentially may be useless. Um, and you can see here, I just stole this. Uh, not very much has been written on, on this. Basically, you're talking 1970s, 80s, early 90s papers, um, largely because, as most of you in the room will know, um, all the focus, if you pick up an APG or any uh, modern uh, 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 paper that looks at uh, new business development and new basins, 99% of the content will be on the paleo environment of the, the reservoir. Nobody gives a monkeys about the source rock. Nobody cares how the oil formed. It just happened and it'll get in there if the trap's big enough. Um, I would argue that we now need to spend much more time, indeed it's the renaissance period for geochemistry, to really understand what forms oil and how does it migrate uh, and how does it uh, occur in rocks. And not, to be honest, having had a year of very detailed um, research here, I, I find that not a lot of people know enough about this. So this is a paper from 1992, and basically it's showing that uh, in different basins, this is for pull-apart basins, when you model it out, different types of source rocks react at different temperatures in terms of their, their oil generation. And this is really, really important um, for uh, uh, shale oil exploration. Oh, it didn't jump forward. Good. Right, so what is S1 and S2 peaks? These are the things you need to be very, very comfortable about uh, when you're going after shale oil. S1 is absolutely critical, and uh, if you want to see, there was a paper presented early, earlier this year at the AEPG uh, annual conference by Marlon Downey looking at using S1 to predict the amount of oil um, that's actually in place. Um, S1 is basically the existing hydrocarbons in the rock. S2 is a number which is saying what is the total potential uh, of hydrocarbons um, in the rock. We basically look at S1 uh, numbers um, uh, because we think they're very important because they give you a, a feeling for how much oil is relevant for shale oil. S2 numbers, which are very commonly quoted as the thing to go after, I, I think they're more useful for things like oil shale where you're going to cook a rock up rather than what oil is actually uh, existing in those pore spaces um, already. But these are the important numbers you need to see if a source rock is, is, is good um, or bad. There we go. So back to petroleum geology uh, 101. Um, again, another area I think is very misunderstood is really understanding where to go after um, uh, shale oil and what actually happens to um, oil and gas. So very Mickey Mouse. Uh, uh, cartoon here, but basically it's to explain that uh, in the world of conventional oil exploration, <coughs> under 10% of all the oil generated in a particular basin actually goes into a conventional trapping mechanism and is, uh, is discovered. Uh, 40 to 50% escapes to the surface and the rest remains within the source rock. Now the recovery factor within the source rock is much, much lower. Um, of course, than you would get in a conventional reservoir. But if you think of the absolute numbers of in situ reserves, that's absolutely huge. Um, now, I don't know if, if, if these numbers resonate with anybody in the room, but we have never seen them published uh, before. So we went uh, out to try and uh, understand um, what were the actual numbers uh, th that corresponded to this. 
And what we found out was that there is a very strong uh, uh, relationship on petroleum basins throughout the world. So if you look at uh, mass balance calculations to try and work out how much oil was generated um, in the world and how much was actually discovered um, or estimated to be discovered if you use USGS uh, uh, numbers, I actually find there's a pretty good correlation. And it, it basically says around about 6% um, of all the oil that's been generated in a particular basin actually gets trapped uh, conventionally. And that's what the, the traditional uh, conventional industry has gone after. Um, around about 40 to 50% gets lost to the surface um, and the rest um, is, uh, is sitting there that could be extracted potentially. Uh, what's important is when you look across uh, all the major hydrocarbon basins um, in the world, um, and this is a snapshot, just looking at North America and Europe, uh, we've looked at over 140 basins and sub-basins in North America and Europe. And here's the data coming out of them. And it basically, the bit at the bottom here, this is what the conventional oil industry has been targeting for 150 years, the, the blue and the orange, or blue and the red. Um, what you've got in green are guesstimates and estimates of what could actually uh, have gone to the surface. And this is the sort of, if you want to use the old management consulting terms, this is the size of the prize uh, for unconventional um, shale oil. Now, the recovery factor here, at the minute, you're talking 1% to 5%. Down here, you're talking in the in most modern, reasonably good quality reservoirs, you're talking 50% um, and higher uh, for oil. Up here, it's 15 to 30% on gas. Down here, it's 75% for on gas. So there obviously is a, um, an offset that even though there is the potential for huge amounts of shale oil um, in the world, the recovery factor um, is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat limited. But that's what we target. This is the research we do to try and nail down where we want to play um, in the world. Right. Um, just going back like, uh, and, and just going into North America in, in particular, um, production um, of oil from um, oil shales or shale oil um, is not new. Uh, when you go out and look at what's happened um, in the Monterey in California over time, when you look in West Siberia, um, you will find that in the 40s, 50s, and maybe even earlier, there will be one or two wells that had a production life where the production came directly from the shale or directly from a limestone or a dolomite associated with the shale. And you can pretty much find this anywhere in North America and Europe if you're prepared to look hard enough. And this is one of the first things that we go off and try and do. Can, do I have evidence in this particular basin that I have seen production coming from uh, the actual source rock horizon or oil, uh, oil or gas shows from, from the source rock. And in many cases, if you look hard enough and you get the right data set, you, you can find out that that, that that is the case. That gives you a good feeling that using modern technology, because all of this will, will have been uh, produced with vertical wells, that with modern technology, 10,000 foot laterals um, and, and, and fracking, and you're seeing fracking now from 30 to 40 <laughs> stage frack jobs, um, you could in theory, get something that produced 50 barrels of oil a day uh, in 1950 should be able to produce with a uh, horizontal well 600 barrels of oil a day in, in today's world with modern technology. Um, so what's happening um, in North America at the minute? Um, some of these names will be familiar to you, some uh, maybe won't be. Um, we heard just before I talked looking uh, at the, the Eagleford. The Eagleford's an interesting one from our point of view. Obviously, from a, a price, uh, current price, um, it's not an area we even bother looking at uh, because the price uh, to get access is so high. We're interested in going after assets uh, that we can get large acreage positions for under $200 uh, an acre. Um, we've been pretty successful at that um, so far, so we're not interested paying six, <coughs> six to twenty-six thousand uh, uh, dollars um, an acre. Um, the Eagleford is a gradational system going from gas through natural gas liquids through condensate to uh, to oil, and you see that with a number of areas uh, here. 
Um, you've got the Utica, uh, which is sitting uh, near the Marcellus. Uh, the Niobrara, which is another up-and-coming name um, in the DJ Basin in, in Colorado and, and the Monterey in California. But th the big daddy of them all, and pretty much the one that's been uh, the most exploited to date in the world of shale oil is actually the Balkan in North Dakota and Montana, uh, where you can see there's um, uh, the USGS estimates that there's um, under 4 billion barrels um, of recoverable reserves um, yet to be extracted from the Williston Basin uh, and the Balkan uh, formations, and we'll look into that uh, in a bit more detail. I haven't put on here where we're active because... Um, as you may know, it is a very and highly competitive uh, 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 process in terms of acquiring acreage and uh, for uh, confidentiality, I've left off our areas uh, of exposure. Um, so here's North Dakota's production over time. Um, what's interesting is that many of these plays have been historical uh, oil producing basins over time. Uh, North Dakota had a little peak in the uh, the late 50s, early 60s, the high oil prices of the late 70s, early 80s saw another um, increase in its, um, in its activity. But it really wasn't until 2005 until um, the Balkan really took off as a major um, uh, oil uh, producer. And you can see what's happened uh, with, the, with the production there. And a lot of it's been heavily influenced uh, by, the, by the oil price, especially as natural gas prices um, have gone down. Um, this is probably where Goldman Sachs are extrapolating from because this is really the only place where you've got any sort of um, history whatsoever. Um, and, you know, if you take the production of every basin in the U.S. Uh, from an oil point of view and extrapolate like that, you know, their numbers could probably be right. I would say it's maybe a bit more difficult than, uh, than a pure extrapolation of the Balkan alone. Um, just breaking down the Balkan, everything in blue at the top, this is coming from unconventional production from the Balkan. So uh, this, uh, all the growth uh, in North Dakota has come from um, exploitation um, of the Balkan, which is mainly a, a four-layer system. You've got the upper, middle, and lower uh, Balkan, and then the three-fork Sanish uh, formation. Uh, the upper and lower uh, Balkan are shales. Uh, the middle Balkan is sort of a, it's sort of a siltstone in places. It's a dull stone in places. It's, it's a really cruddy, uh, very, very low quality uh, conventional reservoir. And then in the three forks, it's a mixture of tight dolomites and, and a bunch of other stuff. It's, this is uh, uh, basically shale sandwich between very low quality conventional uh, reservoirs. And you're seeing production coming from both the shale and from uh, the low quality conventional reservoir uh, adjacent to the source rock today. Um, so here is a, a Balkan well. Um, and you can see just the typical units that you would look for um, in shale oil um, exploration if you're looking to find things. The Balkan, to be honest, is the creme de la creme of what's out there at the minute. Um, so they don't expect to find these numbers in, in many locations because we haven't been able to because they are uh, uh, extremely high. Um, so you're seeing TOCs at 10 and greater. Um, uh, and this is in the well itself. So that's after um, a bunch of the TOCs have been extracted. Um, so uh, the original TOCs, uh, there have been a number of papers published on this, uh, in many cases have been over 20%. Um, you're seeing S1 numbers that are very high, approaching 10 uh, from an S1, that's extremely high. S2s, again, extremely high, uh, uh, heading uh, 50. Basically, you need S1s above 2, uh, typically, to make a, a reasonable uh, shale oil play, and you need S2 uh, numbers you're certainly looking above 20 to make it work. Um, what's interesting is that well, what is the T max? So this is our 135 uh, typical um, oil window um, uh, point, uh, and you're starting to see that you've got basically the, the, the source rock in the, the upper and lower Balkan just creeping into that with vitronite reflectance, probably in the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, uh, regime, so perfect uh, oil generation conditions. The basin stopped going down, it settled in the oil window, and that's pretty much all it did. Um, and 
the units that you're seeing a lot of production from are from the middle Balkan, which is this um, uh, low quality uh, so, uh, low quality reservoir rock and some from the, the upper Balkan at night as well, which is, as you can see, is a pure shale. <coughs> um, this just breaks it down. Um, the middle Balkan, again, low quality um, uh, 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 conventional reservoir rock. Same with the three, uh, the three forks, to be honest. Then you've got this upper Balkan, which is now starting to get a lot, a lot of attention in terms of completing in a shale horizon in the more clastic rich uh, part of that with the higher quartz content. So you can get um, oil from what it would typically uh, be classed as, um, as shale. Um, looking at the production, because uh, a lot of people don't understand how much these things produce, just get any numbers of the North Sea or uh, the Gulf of Mexico out of your head. You're dealing with, at best, a few thousand barrels a day of initial production, um, which after 60 days will decrease by half. So the best wells in the Balkan um, are just over 2,000 barrels a day on average, and you'll be down at 1,000 barrels a day or 1,200 after 60 days. And that's a typical profile. On average, across the Balkan, and so this is basically looking at, um, I'll come to the acreage price in a minute, but this is looking at the productivity. On average in the Balkan, if you look at a five-year sample, so the average of de uh, declining uh, plus um, uh, wells using the best modern technology, you're getting, what, about 180 barrels a day is your average, um, is your average production. Uh, the wells are drilled at between 10 and 11,000 feet. Um, and will cost in the region of five and a half uh, million uh, dollars to, uh, to complete. The API of the oil is very high, um, low sulfur content. These are very profitable wells if you're able to get the high initial production. If you move to an area where you're dealing with 300 barrels on, on IP, which will drop to 150 in 60 days and then plummet even further as you move through the months, then I would argue that even at the current oil price, these uh, wells are not economic. So you have to be very careful that you're focusing in on the very center of the play, the area with the highest um, organic content and the area with the highest uh, initial production rate. And in those places, you can see uh, that um, uh, the, the average dollar per acre price for state acreage sales, so this is not M&A, this is state acreage, so going out and and buying acreage off, uh, off the government has shot up and is now in the $3,000 per acre. And this is outside the core areas. So the core areas you're starting to see transact now at over $20,000 um, an acre. Um, so you can sort of see what our strategy is all about. If we can get in at under $200 an acre uh, and sell the acreage down the road with a few wells in it that prove up the concept, then you can make quite a lot of money on this if, if you uh, drill in successful plays. So just to sum up then, um, the, the Balkan very much kick-started the whole of the, the shale oil uh, uh, concept and the shale oil industry in, in North America. Um, I would say that uh, from the year that we've been studying this in detail and making investments in this space, uh, the industry understanding uh, of shale oil is light years behind that of uh, sh uh, shale gas. Uh, to put it on a like-for-like -like basis, it's basically like going back into uh, the Barnett shale in 2004. That's sort of where we are with, um, uh, with, oil, uh, with shale oil, in my, in my opinion. Um, there are certain characteristics you need to see, but it's not as clear cut as you would see with uh, shale gas. Uh, where shale gas, we've actually run an equation. So we basically look at every new place across the planet based on huge databases, and we apply an equation to the numbers, and that will tell us if uh, uh, the area even looks uh, half interesting from our point of view. That's much harder to do uh, for shale oil, but we're developing techniques to start looking at that. Um, I think that the key thing is that, that there is a huge amount of shale oil to be discovered and extracted. However, it's not uh, as simple as shale gas and every basin will have um, its own differences. And what you're going to see down the road is uh, very much bespoke technology 
um, mm. uh, being developed to tackle uh, the different issues, be it extracting it from the shale or extracting it from low quality conventional reservoirs adjacent to the shale um, or from both. And I think just going back to, you know, I don't think Marlon will mind me saying somebody that's been around in the industry for a seriously long time. Uh, and having had, uh, Marlon was um, uh, head of exploration for uh, Shell and North America and Pecton and, and with Arco. And uh, like having looked at numerous basins across the planet and uh, numerous basins uh, across North America, uh, the numbers he's thinking about are, are several hundred billion barrels of light sweet crude uh, that will be extracted over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Thank you. Again, plenty of time for questions. I, uh, Alan Williams, a geochemist, um, an extinct species, uh, apparently, at some uh, companies. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. That is very reassuring, especially with my BP shares going downhill fast. Um, Neil, that was a very interesting talk. I didn't know you were a closet geochemist. Um, your talk reminded me, Marlon Downey and Dave will remember this, and Fred Meisner gave a wonderful course to BP back in 1980, I think, 30 years ago. And the Barkin show was their classic example of an oil generative basin. And they did point to the, the fact that uh, oil generation actually uh, can be expressed by measuring uh, pressure because uh, the genera generative process uh, gives you uh, a, pr a high pressure kick. Um, so that was just in passing. Uh, I, think, I think you're in, in the right ballpark there. But I would add that you know, if you're looking for geochemistry help, we do happen to have a database that tells you where all the uh, <laughs> oils and gases around the world might be. Uh, but my question was really, you mentioned 50% of the oil actually migrates to surface. You, you didn't mention the magic word seeps. I knew it was on the tip of your tongue there. Um, now, why don't people uh, or industry now exploit surface seeps? I know in Santa Barbara, for example, ARCO used to um, exploit the uh, huge seeps coming to the the seabed there, I don't know if it's still in progress. There must be a huge potential to do that. You've got the migration pathways, you know where the oil and gas is coming up to the surface. Is that a potential resource? Um, yes, I would say, and especially as you go outside North America. I'd say within North America, to be honest, there's so many, uh, there's so many well data points. If you look, I have no idea how many wells have been drilled in North America. Maybe somebody knows. I do know that in the basins that we're active, we're talking hundreds of thousands of wells. And the value of seeps does decline somewhat where you've got data points, even if it's in a fraction of those wells from the source rock across the basin. But I think as you go to Europe and you go further afield, where you've got much more limited data points in terms of well control on the source rock itself, then absolutely seeps are one of the things that we've looked at um, as a mechanism for determining where to go and, and, and start doing further research on, um, on the particular shale itself. I think there is also, um, and we've talked about this as well, there's, um, since we can map the human genome, there is something more that can be done with oil. I'm convinced of it. I um, haven't got there yet, but I'm sure that there is a research project which will start to look and say, can we take a surface seep or a sample of oil from a conventional reservoir and try and back calculate what the source rock may have looked like uh, from its uh, maturation properties? And actually, could we use that as a way of screening um, source rocks around the world? Wojtek Maus, um, really in oil and gas. I wanted to ask about the well spacing and how can you enhance recovery? Do you flush it with water after a while or how do you frack it? Yeah, um, so the well spacing is something that, uh, again, it comes down to this mixture of um, how much are you targeting a low quality conventional reservoir versus, uh, versus shale. Uh, that's the, the first thing that comes to mind, which is basically what are you dealing with. The second thing, quite importantly, is what is your land position like? Um, I, 
on, on top of Atlas' comments initially, which I totally agree with in terms of going after unconventional positions and you need to find the core of a play, et cetera, et cetera, I would add to that you need to have a large contiguous acreage position, which is extremely hard to do in many areas of the world um, where you have to negotiate on a ranch by ranch basis. And we've got one area at the minute where we've got three land teams out there acquiring acreage. And uh, basically, you're going ranch by ranch by ranch, 40 acre ranches um, and, uh, and, and you know, houses by houses to, to get the mineral rights. And it's only when you get contiguous acreage that you can start doing very long fracks because, or else you'll run up to somebody's boundary. So, so that's very, very Im important as well. I think we're going to go through a phase where we drill out using bigger and bigger um, horizontals. So if you look in the Balkan at the minute, you're seeing over 10,000 foot laterals. You're seeing, I think, Whiting are trying a 40 stage frack um, this year, um, which is you know, pretty aggressive given where the industry was a few years ago. Um, and increasing the IP, because if you increase the IP, then basically you're going to recover more within the first few years before it starts to tail off. Nobody has really tackled the idea of, say, using the word secondary recovery. It's a bit strange and unconventional, but you know, secondary recovery. Um, I would argue that a lot of the early wells will probably be refracked, will be the first thing to, uh, to do. Um, and then after that, we'll wait to see what technology comes up with. Um, it's not as easy as flushing uh, with water because in many cases, like there is no water in these systems whatsoever because if there was, you would only get the water, you wouldn't get the oil. Um, so I'm um, not sure further down, uh, further down the road and sort of, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the Balkan looks like in 20 years time. Sorry, uh, David Merzlai, SOTGEN. Uh, just a question transfer transferability. Uh, what is possible in the US becoming what is possible in Europe? Your view? Um, well, there's, there's a few things. Uh, first of all is that like, the technology is obviously transferable if you've got the right equipment on the ground. Um, in Europe currently, the right equipment is not on the ground. Um, I think it'll be a bit of a chicken and egg situation where the demand will have to be there to get the equipment in place to be able to have the right technology to go after this um, in Europe as well. Um, the geology is different in Europe. Uh, if you look at the US in general, it's um, somewhat unique in that you've got a massive landmass that has been tectonically benign for 300 million years with source rock upon source rock upon source rock laid down in a layer cake fashion. So I, looking across the world, uh, the US will probably be the key focus of unconventional hydrocarbons uh, onshore for the future, just because of the geology, I would argue. Um, but it's not to say that there aren't opportunities in Europe and across the world um, for um, uh, shale oil. Um, but it is a bit of a manufacturing process. It doesn't have the aquifer flow and, and pressure to give you extremely high um, uh, initial uh, production rates like you would get from an offshore field. So the impact of it on oil prices, for example, is going to be very much determined by how many rigs you can get drilling all at the one time to give you that, um, that growth rate and production. So it won't have the same effect as you saw opening up the offshore, but it'll definitely have an effect down the road. Okay, just uh, sort of one, oh, sorry, Wayne. Oh, no. no, just one uh, sort of question for me, really, but my impression, and we've talked about it a lot, is the huge technical effort you have to put into to understand the subsurface in these plays. Um, quite different from you know, a man and a dog company going exploring offshore somewhere and relying on consultants and contractors and so on all the time. Huge technical and intellectual effort that you have to put in to, to understand these things. I, I, I'm really asking you if you agree. That it's I, I, I think it's certainly that's our approach to 
Uh, we've just spent a huge amount of time building databases and really understanding what are the mechanisms for forming the oil, um, for uh, effectively narrowing down what are the, 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 the critical factors you need to be looking at. Um, you can take a different approach and, and go out and grab acreage that may be prospective, you think, uh, and hope you can flip it at a very early stage. Some people uh, have gone out and, and done that in some of the 8,000 oil companies in the US, that is their sole business model. Never any intention of drilling a well. Um, uh, you can take the, the other approach, which is go through the M&A market and hope you can capture uh, the people who initially found the oil in the first place, although most of those people don't like to be working for a large oil company, I've, I've found um, o over time. So I, I, it's still an embryonic industry. And I think the way we like to approach it is the way we like to operate, which is understanding as much as possible about the subject matter, building up databases that will give us an edge and going based on fact uh, rather than hoping a lot in, uh, in potential fiction uh, that it's gonna, gonna work out. Okay, at that point.